Women's Club of Aurora has been a significant part of the Community Foundation since 1974, when it sponsored a student loan program for local students. And then in 1990, the club created an advisory endowment fund to channel a portion of its philanthropy to the wider community. Since it was established, the advisory fund has awarded thousands of dollars in grants to local nonprofit organizations. In honor of our long-standing partnership, the Community Foundation is proud to pay tribute to the Women's Club of Aurora through the production of this historic video. The Women's Club was founded in 1891. However, the official vote to form the club took place on December 12, 1890 at the Grand Army of the Republic in downtown Aurora. The 18 women who voted on that day were members of an art association that convened each Friday in Batavia to hear lectures on history, art, and travel, given by Anna Picard Atkins of Chicago. Mrs. Atkins also was an author who wrote The Art of Entertaining. When she came to Aurora to give a lecture, Nearly 400 women attended. Mrs. Atkins truly was the spark that encouraged the Aurorans to create their own club. The club became active on October 27, 1891, with a membership of 48. The club's original motto continues to inspire its members to this day. Not what we give, but what we share. For the gift without the giver is bare. Who gives himself with his alms feeds three, himself, his hungering neighbor, and me. Initially, club meetings were held in the homes of members or in the Empire Hall, which was located on the third floor of the Brady Block. In those days, large commercial buildings were referred to as blocks. The Brady Block stood on the corner of Broadway and Galena in downtown Aurora. The first officers of the club were President M. Louise Van Arsdale, first vice president Francis P. Forsyth, second vice president E. R. Knickerbocker, recording secretary Alice Maud George, corresponding secretary Maria Alice Burton, and treasurer Margaret Gray. The original bylaws stated that each member was to pay an initiation fee of $3, and the annual dues were only $2 per member. Programs during those first years reflected the concerns of the day. What shall we do with our boys? What shall we do with our girls? Clara Barton and the Red Cross Society political economy, art as an educator, and how to profit by the World's Fair. The 1893 World's Fair was held in Chicago, and the Women's Club was already preparing its members for participation in this once-in-a-lifetime event. As membership increased, the club rented rooms in the City Club, which was located in the Downing Block, a building on River Street. From there, they rented space in Clark Hall, whose location is unknown. Later, they took a room in the Ziegler Building, furnishing it themselves. The Ziegler Building was located on Downer Place and Water Street. The club met in this location until 1895, when the building was destroyed by fire. They then returned to the City Club. Divakey Hall also was their home for a short time. It was located on Main Street, now Galena Boulevard, between LaSalle Street and Lincoln Avenue. Later, they occupied rooms in the Grand Army of the Republic, taking their salvaged furniture out of storage. Once again, they had a furnished room of their own. One of the club's goals was to unite women from the east and west sides of Aurora. 
by holding meetings in downtown Aurora, this objective was successfully met. In 1893, a kindergarten association was formed in Aurora, which many club members supported with financial gifts and furnishings. When the association disbanded, the Women's Club took over the operations of the kindergarten for several years until it was incorporated into the public school system. In 1894, the club divided into three departments, Art and Literature, Home and Education, and Reform and Philanthropy. However, in these early years, the club focused its efforts on children and education. Initially, they furnished clothing for needy children who otherwise could not attend school. This initiative included the proviso that the school boards cooperate by appointing truant officers. The partnership with the schools continued until a change in state law made school attendance mandatory. Annual bazaars were held as fundraisers for the club's philanthropy. The largest was held in 1905 in the Old Coliseum in partnership with local merchants and other organizations. More than $10,000 was raised at the event. Another club activity focusing on children included redecorating schoolrooms through the hanging of paintings and American flags. By the time the project was completed, Oak Street School, Center School, South Lake Street School, and Brady School had two rooms decorated. Within those rooms, nearly 100 pictures and plaster casts were placed, representing the best in painting and sculptures. In addition, the club started classes at the high schools in cooking, carpentry, kitchen gardens, sewing, and physical culture. These classes eventually were assumed by the schools. Club members also started a circulating library and assisted in developing and conducting a school for the deaf. During the earliest years, the club worked diligently to help the poor and sick. Between 500 and 1,000 garments a year were distributed to the Aurora City Hospital, the Rest Home, Charity Council, and needy soldiers. One year, the club's gift of sheets, pillowcases, blankets, and towels to the city hospital was so generous that the hospital's board of directors conferred life membership upon the club. In 1907, a citywide cleanup day was sponsored by the club. Twenty-five teams of women worked all day filling up numerous city horse-drawn trash wagons. As a result, civic consciousness was awakened to the desirability of having a clean, healthy city. As the membership increased, the club rented various rooms until 1912, when they moved into the new YWCA building on Downer Place. In 1912, the Civic Committee of the club maintained the playground at Herds Island. Later, Club members had lights installed at the city's playgrounds, which provided a place for the boys who worked in factories to spend their evenings. Then, in 1917, the club handed over the operations of the playgrounds to the city. As the many projects to improve the lives of children clearly demonstrate, it was the Women's Club that was proactive in identifying and responding to the unmet needs of the community. During World War I, the club equipped and maintained a Red Cross room at the Aurora Public Library, where surgical dressings were made. This photo, from the early 1900s, depicts a traditional classic structure that faithfully served Aurora citizens for over 100 years. The club promoted victory gardens by distributing literature and obtaining garden lots. Members then worked in the schools to help in the canning of the produce. For many years, club members brought groceries to the Juvenile Protective Association's Home for Children, 
which was located on South Elmwood Drive in Aurora. The well-being of children remained a major focus of the club. Then, in 1923, the members realized their dream of having their own home by purchasing the People's Church on Galena Boulevard and Lincoln Avenue. The purchase price was $8,000. The church was built in 1866 as Aurora's Universalist Church. Twenty years later, a group called the People's Church took it over. This photo, from 1886, showcases the original steeple and the beautiful staircases that are no longer a part of the structure. These early postcards of Aurora include photos of the houses that were adjacent to and across the street from the church. How the area has changed. After the Women's Club purchased the building, they spent another $20,000 remodeling the historic structure. In 1924, the formal opening of the club was held, dazzling the public with its beautiful works of art. In 1926, the club opened the junior department, and 40 daughters of club members joined. Also that year, a music committee was formed. The highly regarded Women's Club Chorus entertained for many civic groups. Two years later, the Reform and Philanthropy Department was renamed Community Service, and the American Citizenship and the Conservation and Garden Departments were added. In addition, the club started a school for immigrants, which prepared them for citizenship. The Art and Literature Department of the club and the Art League of Aurora co-sponsored an exhibition of paintings featuring the works of Nellie Scheinert, Ruth Van Sickle Ford, Grace Johnson, and May Holscher. The Women's Club truly had become an integral part of Aurora. The club's projects changed to meet the needs of the time. Scholarships were awarded to students in the areas of art, conservation, and music. Also, the city benefited from the many plantings donated by the club. The Conservation and Garden Department published articles in the newspaper to promote their activities. Then, in 1971, the club voted to sell the old historic building that had been their home for nearly 50 years. The constant repairs that were needed meant that fewer dollars remained for philanthropy. On January 21, 1972, the building was sold to Faith Tabernacle Church for $55,000. During the next 40 years, the club continued its commitment to the community. In 1980, the club awarded a $50,000 gift and its collection of paintings to Aurora College for the school's alumni dining hall. The club also provided $12,000 to the Aurora Historical Society for a new computer system and also for audiovisual equipment, which enabled the organization to present high quality educational programs to local schools and the public. And in 1990, a $25,000 endowment fund was established within the Community Foundation for the perpetual awarding of grants in the name of the club. The following year, the club proudly celebrated 100 years of service to the Aurora community. Longtime members Jane Whitson, Edna Rollins, Lois Holney, and Peg Steinable played significant roles in the festivities. Dorothy Ellis served as president, and Martha Bine served as vice president of the club during the centennial. Through the years, members have been recognized for their many contributions. In 1998, past president Peg Steinable was honored by the city of Aurora as the Grand Marshal of the Fourth of July Parade. Also that year, Martha Bine became the secretary of the Illinois General Federation of Women's Clubs. 
Later, she was elected president of the organization. In May 2013, the club celebrated many accomplishments. 25-year membership awards were presented to Martha Bine, Carol Job, Bonnie Sheppel, Maxine Jacobson, Mary Cassidy, and Mary Barbie. Also in 2013, the following former presidents were honored. In the back row are Barb Penner, Dorothy Sullivan, Jean Hazelhorst, Mary Barbie, and Martha Bine. In the front row are Esther Amos and Martha Lewis. Since its founding, the Women's Club of Aurora has been a shining example of philanthropy at its best. The lives of thousands of local citizens have been enriched through the efforts of this compassionate organization. May the Women's Club of Aurora continue its tradition of service for generations to come. Our grateful community has indeed been blessed by its presence among us.